Good morning, family. Welcome our friends from around the world and GCI Home Church family. If you don't have the notes, please let us know and we will get them to you. The theme for this week is Freed from Shame. And our scriptures this week discuss how we being freed from shame and sin enables us to love and serve others. The call to worship in Psalm 29 verse 1 through 11 reminds us to ascribe glory to, to God who blesses us with peace. Peace is an attribute of living under God's grace. Isaiah 6 recounts Isaiah's vision of God and how he was cleansed of his shame and set free from service. In Romans 8, Paul encourages us to break free from shame's hold and embrace our adoption as beloved children of God. Lastly, John 3 is our sermon text that uses Nicodemus' story to illustrate how we move from darkness to light. This is a good illustration to help us move from bearing shame and shortcomings to sharing God's love freely Amen. with others. We have joy in Jesus. Let's, pray. let's, let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. We know, oh God, that you've given us this day. We can praise you and we can worship you. Father, we come and we lay all of our, our cares at your feet because you care for us. We thank you, O oh God, for your healing and for your forgiveness. We thank you, O oh God, for your mercy that's new and fresh every day. We know, O oh God, that you are here and we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. And so bless today's message. Bless the hearing, the delivery, Father, and also the encouragement and the inspiration that will come from your word. We praise you now in Jesus' name. We say it together. Amen. 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 Your mercy never fails me 
in all my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. so much for joining us this morning. The topic for this morning, as you know, is moving from shame to the love and the greatness and the goodness of God. And the title of the message is Moving from Darkness to Light. You know, it seems like you can find a test for almost anything online. You know, there's actually an online test called the shame test. And it kind of gives you, and it kind of enables you to kind of self-diagnose whether or not you struggle with shame. And we all know that, you know, self-diagnosis may not be the best thing. But it's interesting, when you, when you think about some of the questions that I saw in this online test, it's called the shame test. And it basically says that you answer yes or sometimes, then maybe, just maybe, you've had an encounter with shame. Listen to these questions. Is it relatively easy for me to criticize members of my family, people at work or school, or even myself. If I answer yes or sometimes, then maybe I've had an encounter with shame. How about this next one? I have heard, I have a hard time believing that someone can fully love and accept me. You ever feel that way sometimes? That, that you just can't be fully loved and accepted just the way God made you. How about this one? I get defensive when others criticize me. Sometimes. How about this one? I don't accept compliments well. Every time some, someone gives me a compliment, I try to deflect it and take it away or nullify it. 
And when I'm lost, I, I find it difficult to ask for directions or help. Well, when things go wrong, I have a hard time accepting blame. Or do I always blame myself when anything happens, even when I'm not wrong? How about this one? I, I find it hard to relax without feeling guilty. I feel things must be done my way because my way is always the right way. Or I feel embarrassed or humiliated by certain things from my past. I, I try to get past it, but things just keep, keep coming up and bringing that baggage into my mind and I just can't seem to let it go. How about the last one? I, I rarely reveal my feelings. I just keep everything because I don't want people to see the real me. And basically, based on how we answer these questions, all, all of us have probably, on some level, dealt with shame. But before we continue, let's, let's define what shame is. There's an author and researcher named Brene Brown. She says, shame is defined as the intensely painful experience of believing that we are flawed and that therefore we're unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, something we've done or, or failed to do it makes, us, makes us unworthy of connection, makes us unworthy of truly being accepted in love. Brown goes on to say that shame is often the source of hurtful behavior and that it can make us dangerous and create dangerous feelings in us. That views, that, that changes how we view ourselves and others. You see, most of us have faced some shame and felt unworthy of love and belonging at some point in time in our lives. But for believers of the way, for disciples of Christ, for Christians, shame can come when we don't fully grasp how deeply loved and forgiven we are by God. How, we, how we, we don't fully grasp how deeply loved and forgiven we are or that the most appropriate response to our inclusion in the relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is to love and to share our gifts with others. In other words, shame can come when we fail to embrace what our true identity is in Christ and we begin to compare ourselves to others or even Jesus Christ himself. See, the irony is that we can feel shame even when we feel blessed. See, the enemy likes to see us in the darkness of shame rather than in the light of our true identity. And I pray that as we go through this message this morning, that wherever we are in that process, that the Holy Spirit would move us from darkness to light. Because when sin and shame are cast aside, when we grasp how deeply loved and forgiven we are, and we embrace our true identity and relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, that is when we move from darkness to light. See, the issue of shame isn't new. We, we learn a lot about how we let go of the darkness of shame and move into the light of who we are in Jesus Christ, into newness of life, when we look at the example of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, or whether it be online Bibles or your Bible, physical Bibles, turn with me in your Bibles over to John chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 17, where Nicodemus visits Jesus. Starting in chapter 3, verse 1, we read, Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus responds and said to him, well, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into his mother's womb and, and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. 
Don't be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. See, the wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, you are, are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so that so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that Everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So as we look at this passage, we're going to look at what we can learn from the word of God. Let us pray. <coughs> Loving Father, we come before your throne in the mighty strong name of Jesus, thanking you and praising you, giving you glory and honor for the blessing of being able to, to come to, to, to celebrate and to worship together this morning in different corners of the world. Lord, we've come in together in community, in prayer and worship, in growing in grace and knowledge and being transformed more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we welcome where your presence we pray that you would transform us. We thank you, Lord, that, that your word goes out just as the, the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to a void without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it gives seeds for the sore and bread for the eater. Lord, we praise you that so is your word that goes out from your mouth. It will not return to you void, but will accomplish what you desire and achieve the purpose, Lord God, for which you sent it. And so, God, we exalt you this morning. We thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God. I pray that you move me out of the way with my opinions, shortcomings, misunderstandings, so that you alone will be magnified and glorified as you minister to your people through your spirit this morning. So we thank you, we love you, and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. On this Trinity Sunday, John chapter 3, it offers the chance for Jesus to talk about all three persons of the Trinity. Verses 5 through 8 talk about the Holy Spirit. Verses 13 through 15, it discusses Jesus as the Son and predict the cross. And verses 16 and 17, it goes back to the foundation of the Father's great love for all humanity and the lengths that he would go to break the bonds of shame so that all might know their worth in God's sight and go from darkness unto light. And so let's look at this passage of scripture here. It says here in John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. So Nicodemus wasn't just a normal person off the street. He, he was one of the leaders of the Jews. And he came to Jesus by night and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Don't you think it's interesting he didn't say, I know? He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. You see, the, the Gospel of John, if we study the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John has this recurring theme of darkness versus light. Notice that Nicodemus came to meet with Jesus at night. Why? As a leader of the Jews, was, was he afraid of what they would say? Well, was he beginning to see and believe and understand that, that Jesus was truly sent from God? Was he moving from darkness to light? 
Notice the words that he says. He says, no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And so what we see is the first thing is that only through the spirit can we see or enter the kingdom of God. See, Jesus answered him very truly. I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus is confused. Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about, Jesus? I mean, my mother birthed me once. How can I be born again? This Greek word that's translated from above, it can also be translated again. And Jesus knows this. And at that moment, it's interesting. He doesn't move, remove the confusion or misunderstanding from the mind of Nicodemus. And you know, sometimes... God will let us wrestle with the words that he speaks. To wrestle with this truth, knowing that as we continue to wrestle with that truth, it will change us. Knowing that as we continue to grapple with it and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to it, it will change our hearts and minds. Some things we just can't see or understand unless the Spirit gives us that understanding. Have you ever been reading a passage of scripture and just, just couldn't really get it? And the more you grapple with it, the more you prayed about it, the more we asked God for understanding and insight, he began to open up our hearts and minds to receive the word that he had for us. You see, we can't see the kingdom. We can't understand what God is doing or even appreciate the glory and goodness of the kingdom unless the Lord opens up our hearts unless he opens up our eyes, unless he opens up our minds, and we, we pray the prayer. Remember the song, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Open up the eyes of our hearts, Lord. And that's our prayer. When we're going into the word of God, we're saying, God, open up the eyes of my heart so that I can see the kingdom life, so that I can walk the kingdom life, so that I can live the kingdom life. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above, or you must be born again. And then he gives this amazing analogy. The wind blows where it chooses. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or, or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. The spirit will move so quickly and powerfully in our lives that we or those around us won't even know how God did it. One day our mind is just fully set on fleshly things. One day our mind is filled with selfishness, pride, and greed, and the Spirit comes in and changes our mindset. We know that it is a process day by day by day, but he gives us a new life. When he gives us a new birth, guess what he does? He's giving us a new life. New birth means new life. No longer living according to the flesh, but now living according to the spirit who has given us a new birth in Jesus Christ. I ask the question to myself as the Holy Spirit as we're going through this passage. Do we live according to the spirit or do we live according to the flesh? Do we walk according to the spirit in the kingdom life or do we walk according to the flesh in this earthly walk? Jesus explains the Holy Spirit. Specifically, he contrasts our, our fleshly human responses. A lot of times that, that human response is shame-based. And it confines us. That, that human response is based on our past and things we've done. But, but God is saying the Spirit of God is freedom. That there is freedom in the Spirit of God. And the Spirit's freedom moves where it chooses. The second thing we see is that eternal life is through belief in and acceptance of Jesus Christ. Eternal life is through belief in Jesus Christ and through acceptance of Jesus Christ 
as Lord and Savior. The, the word of God says here, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the son of man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Isn't that powerful? Jesus is, he, only the son of man has ascended, ascended into heaven. Only the son of man has descended from heaven and ascended again. You see, Jesus makes a reference to his crucifixion by talking about Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. Over in, in Numbers chapter 21, verse 9, that's what this passage refers to. It refers to when the Israelites were traveling to the promised land. Remember, they were sinning because they were speaking against the, the Lord. They were speaking against Moses. They were speaking against God. They were, they, they, they were complaining and griping and, and frustrated with God. And many were bitten by poisonous snakes and died. But the way they were healed was to look upon a bronze snake statue that was put up on a pole. Jesus compares the healing of the snake bites to the healing of our soul, to the healing of our feeling of shame, and to the healing of our sin, to the healing of our separation from God. Jesus is saying, look to him. Look to me and live, Jesus says. He came. He didn't just come. He came so that we may could have life and have that life in abundance. He came that those who believe would have eternal life. That when we look to Jesus, it changes everything in our lives. It changes every aspect of how we view life. We look to Jesus daily for restoration and for a peace that surpasses all understanding. We look to Jesus. And so just as that serpent, that bronze serpent was lifted up that people would look to it and live, and Jesus says, so, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that all who look to him would have eternal life. And the third thing, God's love. God's love and desires for all humanity is eternal life. God's love and his desire for all humanity is eternal life and to be free from condemnation and death. Look what this passage says, a passage that many of you probably know by heart. Many, a passage that many of you probably have shared over and over again with family members and friends. For God so loved the world. Don't you love that? For God so loved the world. God isn't angry at the world. God isn't angry at the world right now. The world has, has anger towards God, but God has nothing but love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Eternal life is open for all humanity. That everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You know, John 3.16 it is one of the best loved, the most memorized verses in the world. But the reality is that verse 16 isn't complete without the context of verse 17. Jesus came so that we could be included in the relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit God. Verse 17 tells us that God did not send Jesus to condemn or shame the world, but to break the feelings of shame and separation that make us feel far off from God. God came to transform our lives and transforms our minds and, and gave us a new mindset of him and ourselves. And that's process when we repent and we change our minds about God and we change our minds about one another and ourselves. We begin to break free from those feelings of shame and separation and begin to embrace the reality of our identity in Jesus Christ and the embrace of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit God. And so we may all struggle 
in some ways with shame as we grow in our understanding and belief in God's great love for us. As we do that, we begin to let go of those feelings of unworthiness and embrace ourselves, the imperfections and all, as beloved children of God. So as we look at this passage of scripture today, there are a few things I want to leave us with that are just daily practical applications that we can put into practice every aspect of our day. And the first thing is this, recognize that shame affects us all. In some ways, we've all, we've all been affected by shame. And it can keep us from sharing our gifts and God's love with others. Brené Brown says that, that speaking about shame, it helps us to decrease its power. That when we focus on the high value God has placed on every individual, we can see we're all growing in grace and knowledge bit by bit by bit. Bit by bit, we are, become, we are being transformed into the image of God. And so comparison among ourselves and, and are harmful and only lead to judgment and shame. God has freed us from shame's hold through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. The second thing is remember the story of Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus, he moves from darkness to light. He goes from shame to freedom to love. It doesn't happen all at once. But after this passage in John chapter 3, we don't hear more about Nicodemus throughout the remainder of Jesus' ministry. We could easily assume he just ran off into the night. Remember, he, he came to meet Jesus at night, which shows something, too, that, that Jesus is available all the time. He's available morning, noon, and night. If you don't if there's something that says, I can't meet Jesus here, Jesus says, I know whatever you need, I have it. Whenever you need to meet me, I'm going to be there. So you would think that Nicodemus had that meeting with Jesus and ran off into the night, but you never hear from him again. But, but Jesus had given him a lot to think about, but we don't know exactly what happened. But we do see by Nicodemus' actions that he did believe Jesus enough to honor him with Joseph of Arimathea by bringing a large number of spices to bury the body of Jesus as we find in John chapter 19, verses 38 through 42. So as a Pharisee, Nicodemus, he took a risk by doing this. Given the culture of his day, we could see this as evidence of his move from disbelief, shame, and cultural constraints to a life of love and freedom in Christ. At the end of the life of Christ, he didn't care what people thought. He was there helping to cover the body of Jesus with spices for burial. He moved from disbelief and meeting Jesus at night to not even being concerned what people thought. So remember the story of Nicodemus. No matter where we start out, God has us on a journey to take us where he desires for us to be. So don't beat yourself up. Don't get discouraged. Know that you're on an upward motion and an upward progress being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And the third thing is to remind yourself daily of your true identity. Read God's word. Read what God's word says about you and me, that we're his beloved children, that, 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 that he has done everything that we need that we have everything we need for life and godliness through Jesus Christ. Consider taking up this approach when any shaming or negative thoughts come up. Go to the word of God. Replace that shame or those negative thoughts with, with the biblical affirmation, which means it's important to stay in the word of God. And guess what? The, 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 with, with computers and phones, just if you type in biblical af affirmations, you're going to get a whole list of them that you can speak over your life, day by day. These are the words of God and what God says about you. Because the enemy in our flesh is always going to say things that tries to tear us down. And so if thinking, instead of thinking about the recurring thoughts of past failures, think on 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 that says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the creation, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. And that's what God is telling you and me. You're, if you're in Christ, 
You're a new creation. The old is gone. The new person is here. So the story of Nicodemus, it shows us how, how we can move toward a greater understanding of God's love for us and the inherent value and worthiness he has placed on us as his beloved children. And see, by embracing the freedom that we have to be imperfect yet loving human beings, we gift others with the permission to do the same. You see, brothers and sisters, shame and sin are cast aside when we grasp how deeply loved and forgiven we are. Shame and sin are cast aside when we grasp how deeply loved and forgiven we are. And we embrace our true identity as beloved children of God and our relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit God. It is then that we move from darkness to light. He said yes already to you. Even before we were born, Jesus said yes to all humanity. He said, I'm coming to cast your sin and shame aside. I want you to grasp how deeply loved that you are. I want you to know that you are forgiven. I want you to embrace your true identity. I want you to embrace the relationship that you have with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit God. And as we said last week, and when Jesus said, the same love that the Father has for me, he has for you. Brothers and sisters, that moves us from darkness into the glorious light of Jesus Christ. And so I invite you this morning to say yes to his yes. I invite you to move from sin and shame to light. From sin and shame to embracing love and God's amazing forgiveness. And that's what he offers to you and to me. Let us pray. Loving Father, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus. We thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor, Lord God Almighty. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to come together this morning, this afternoon, wherever a time frame people are, to give you glory and to lift up our hearts to you through worship and being transformed more into the image of Christ. We thank you for this Trinity Sunday that helps us to recognize that we have a relationship and our identity is in being embraced by the triune Father, Son, and Holy Spirit God. Father, thank you for sending your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for going back to the Father and sending us Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we today, wherever we are, God, we want to say yes to your yes. We want to say, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, we are calling on the name of the Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that we believe that he is your son, that we believe he was born of the Virgin Mary, that he walked on this earth and lived a perfect life, that we believe, Heavenly Father, that, that he was crucified and that he rose on the third day and he sits at your right hand making intercession for each and every one of us. And so we say, Lord God, I welcome your son into my life to lead me, to guide me, to, to help me to know that I'm forgiven and loved. Change my mind. Give me a spirit of repentance to change my mind about me, about you, about humanity, about sin, so that I can see these things from your perspective and through your eyes, God. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord. We want to see you, God. We love you, we worship you, and we honor you. In the mighty, strong name of Jesus, all of God's beautiful children said, Amen. 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 Only your grace. We run to you, God. It's only your grace, Lord.
in the name of Jesus. Lord, we come before your throne this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus for those that may be, those that may be suffering from shame as they look back over their past, as they look at their lives and things they've done, mistakes that they've made. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray that today would be their day of freedom. Lord, we pray that you would help them to know that they are forgiven. Lord, that you have cast all sin into a sea of forgetfulness. And Lord, that you transform us day by day into the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that it is by your grace, your grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness. We thank you that it is by your grace that we are, we are accepted and transformed and loved. And it is by Jesus Christ, our Savior, that gives us a new life, a new birth and a new life. And so, Lord, we thank you for your healing, your restoration, and we've received it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, and we look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. <laughs>